one of them. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on. Good morning. Thank you. Let me know. I can't see you. I got the lights. I just, if you guys don't talk, I got nothing, you know. So, haven't been able to be together in a couple weeks, uh, not just for our online audience, but us too. We got, uh, we got canceled the last week in November, and then uh, we had some, uh, a snow day in there, and just kind of uh, crazy that happens. Um, and then uh, we're going to be live uh, this week, the 8th, next week, the 15th, and the following week, the 22nd. The 22nd, uh, we've reserved this space kind of the whole day so we can have a uh, potluck together just to celebrate the holidays and, and hang out. So if you got that, that time free, just know that after we're done, we're going to tear down, kind of put everything away, and everybody can bring a dish to pass, and we're just going to spend some time together in fellowship. We haven't been able to do that in a while, um, and, uh, and Christina is putting that together. Um, so if you have any questions... Uh, she's on Facebook. You can ask her or, or uh, go through me, and I'll I'll talk to her for you. I'm not putting it together. This one's not on me. So, um, but it'll be a it'll be a good time of fellowship, just to to, to um, enjoy each other's presence and company. So that'll be the 22nd. Then the 29th, that week between Christmas and New Year's, we never have service. We just a lot of churches do special services and stuff for the holidays. We just shut it down so people can be with their families and. Um, if you got to travel or you got family coming in, then enjoy them. Don't uh, don't make this uh, a, a duty or an obligation. Spend that time with family and love them. And then, of course, the week of the fifth, our first week in um, 2020, we can't have our building again. So that's why we're doing our best to be on these next three weeks and and uh, um, be there for everybody. So we will have two weeks off. The 29th of 2019, December 29th, and July 5th, 2020, uh, we will be off. We won't have any service. So, And then with our luck, we'll have a blizzard the following week. You know, So see you in March, and um, uh, that's, wh that's where we're going to be. But this week, we have one session left to do in our series on Lamentations. We haven't finished Lamentations chapter 5. And so I, I wanted to spend some time together and, and wrap that up before we go into the New Year's. I've got lots of people asking me, when are we going to get back to the Where We Got Our Bible series? I can't wait to get back to when we got that. We're going to get back to that in 2020. We're not gonna, we're, I'm not going to try to jump back into that prior to the close of the new year. It doesn't make sense to go into anything that deep when everybody's got friends and family and relatives. But we are going to have some exciting stuff, just, just some one-offs uh, in the next uh, coming coming weeks, and that's cool. In fact, I um, just this past week, <coughs> I got word from um, somebody in California who watches our, our feed and uh, was doing part of a Bible study, and they asked me, where's that, where's that session that you did, just that one session on how to share your testimony and how you, how you get to, to distill your testimony down to something small that's not like a big meandering story that includes everything that ever happened to you, your cousins, and your cousins' cousins. And I pointed that out to them, and I guess as a group, they kind of went through that, and it was a, it was a helpful tool to them. And so I, I just get so touched when I find out that even the historic resources that, that we're able to put in our video library on YouTube and Facebook is, is a tool to people, and it's facilitating further communication, and it's now facilitating little Bible studies, and that, that's just exciting to me. So... Um, praise the Lord that that's happening. Well, why don't we bow our heads, close our eyes, and then we'll get into the word together for a little bit this morning. Oh, Father, we, we just take a moment, <laughs> take a moment to calm our heart, quiet ourselves. This is, <coughs> it's a joyous time of year, but it's a busy time of year. For my family alone, God, I know we have business trips and we have company coming and and there's there's always so much going on and yet at the same time it's a time that we want to be reflective we want to ponder you and so whether we're watching this back a few days from now or we're participating live i pray that that the ser the sessions that we share in the coming weeks would be meditative for people it would be things to reflect upon it would be it would be places to to put your heart and, and, and reflect in this time of year that we choose to remember you, to honor you, 
This year we talked about the mosaic feasts and what Israel does. But this, for the Western world, this is a feast where we remember that you came and you were the gift for all of humanity, that the war between man and God could be over. And we thank you for that, that you did indeed this time of year come and bring peace on earth and goodwill toward men. As we meditate on your word, I pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would write it on our heart, that you would show us things about your truth that we have not seen before. Anoint my words, Master. In Jesus' name, the people of God pray. Amen. Well, we're going to go to Lamentations chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to do this like one of our verse-by-verse -verse commentaries. There's only 22 verses in this chapter. And in case you have forgotten, that is kind of typical for this little book uh, that is, for the most part, appended to one of the largest books in the Bible, if not the largest book in the Bible, the, the book of the prophet Jeremiah, because Jeremiah wrote this book. Jeremiah's job for a lot of of his prophetic career, not all of it, because at the beginning he was kind of like other prophets, but, but for most of his prophetic career, became to give the message of it's too late. You have not repented. And so now, because of your lack of repentance, Israel, you are going to be taken captive by an empire that invades from the north called Babylon, your cities are going to be destroyed. You're going to be oppressed by another regime. Your freedoms are forfeit because you did not obey me. And he instead then begins to say, you will be in captivity for 70 years. The reason that it's 70, a lot of people, and I don't think I've covered this in this series, so, so maybe for for um, giggles, we'll just do this first. This one won't be up on the screen because in all fairness, I didn't tell them I was going to do this, okay? Um, let me look this verse up for you. I don't know where it is atop my head. So go to Matthew 18 really quickly. Matthew 18, starting at about verse 21. It says, then Peter came to him, him being Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And of course, if you know Peter, Peter is, this is, this is Peter prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Peter Peter's, uh, suffers from a chronic case of foot and mouth disease. He is always trying to, be the one whose sense of bravado kind of shows that he's the best of the disciples. And so essentially what he's trying to do here, Jesus says, I'm willing to forgive people seven times, Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm pretty incredible. And, um, and Jesus, as Jesus always does with Peter, they had such a funny relationship in that sense. Jesus turns it upside down on him and he says, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And there's a parable that follows this, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna proceed that far. Many, many pastors, they teach that the reason that Jesus isn't picking a specific number, he's just trying to give Peter a number that, that is the equivalent of a lot. 70 times seven, infinitely. You just always forgive. Any math students in here, can you tell me how much 70 times seven is? How much? What? Exactly. It's 490. So when Israel went into captivity, they were going to be in captivity for how many years? 70. One of the reasons the prophets tell Israel that they're going into captivity is because they have forsaken the Sabbath of the land. And in case you don't know what that is, or in case you've forgotten what that is, in the Levitical law, it was ordered by God because the land did not belong to the citizens of Israel. They, in fact, leased it. It was, it was a biblical principle that God owned the land, and he blessed you. 
But if you stop serving him, he would kick you out of the land. In fact, it even goes so far as to say the land will vomit you out. I don't ever want to be vomited. That does not sound fun. You know, because I'm not liquid, so that means technically I'm a chunk. That's not the part of that I want to be, you know. So you'll take that home. Deb's like cringing. She's going to remember this sermon for the rest of her life because I said that. This is the, this is the point. The Sabbath rest of the land was every seven years. They were to plant and they were to, they were to water and they were to harvest for six years. But that seventh year was a Sabbath for the land to rest. The earth was to lie fallow and the people were to depend on God that he would create enough increase that the extra increase from the sixth year and whatever the land naturally grew the seventh year would take care of them. Can you imagine being in a place where God says, okay, you can work six years, but the seventh year you're taken off. You need to trust that I'm going to give you enough resources to care for your family that in that seventh year, you're not going to work. You're going to give that to me and you're just going to trust me. How many Christians in America's churches today do you think I could convince to make that step of faith? See, people get all up in arms when they say, well, you got to give 10% of your money to God. Yeah, that was the smallest thing that God asked for in the Old Testament. Every 49 years, they had to take two years off, the Sabbath year and then the Jubilee year, the 50th year. It's crazy. But because they didn't do this, they neglected the Sabbaths. God, in effect, said, you owe me 70. So can anybody tell me if they had to take off 70 Sabbaths, because that's how many they neglected to give God for how many years did they neglect those Sabbaths? The answer is real simple. 490 years. So when Jesus is telling Peter, how many times should you forgive? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. He's not picking some random number that's just a lot. He's saying, I forgave Israel 490 times. Every detail in the Bible is there for a reason. I can't tell you how many pastors just miss that, just gloss right over that. We're supposed to have infinite forgiveness for it. No, no, you missed the point. There comes a point when judgment comes. And Jesus is saying, God forgave your nation 490 times. He's being very specific. And so, of course, after that, the people are swept out. There's three sieges of the city of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the last one, of course, absolutely destroying the temple, destroying the city walls. People like Ezekiel and Daniel were, were uh, taken captive in earlier sieges and forced to live in exile in Babylon. Jeremiah himself had to flee to Egypt to avoid the persecution of the evil Israelite king. At the time, he returns to a Jerusalem that has been sacked and destroyed Fires are burning in the distance. He sees the temple of Solomon destroyed, the Shekinah glory no longer abiding in the Holy of Holies near the Ark of the Covenant. He weeps, and in this book of Lamentations, he writes five funeral dirges, five songs of sorrow. That is what we have been talking about in this series of Lamentations where we've gone through one chapter of the next. Uh, we did two sessions on chapter three just because it's, uh, twice as, uh, three times as long as the other chapters. And we've talked about how all of these chapters were built. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 all have 22 verses. And they each, each, each stanza begins with the next consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3 has 66 verses, so it repeats that pattern three times in total. Chapter 5, the chapter we're in this morning, to put this thing a cap on it, put, put the bookends together and kind of button it up, has 22 verses, but it does not follow that pattern. And as we began to see in the previous session, Jeremiah was talking about still having hope, still continuing to speak, not now to the generation that was judged, but to the generation that would be coming back from the captivity to have faith in a God who they never knew in their own land because it was going to come up to the generation of Ezra and the generation of Nehemiah to, 
rebuild the walls and to rebuild the temple. Massive piece of the history of the Old Testament explained in just a few moments for you there. Let's now dive in and see where we're at with that context. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 1 <coughs> says, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. <coughs> it says, Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens, our house to foreigners. And what he's talking about is the practice when, 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 a, when a massive empire like Egypt or a massive empire like the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians who would, of course, come later, they would dispossess the people that lived in a region and they would spread their culture out throughout all of the empire and then they would bring colonists in from the different provinces of their empire and seed them into that new territory to ensure loyalty of the newly conquered land. Does that make sense? But to those that grew up in Israel and understood the territories of Be uh, Dan to Beersheba, they, uh, th those, those colonists that were brought in, they were foreigners, they were aliens, but they now had the rights because they were citizens of the empire. Imagine then what that would be like to have your country taken over by foreigners who had more rights than you did. Can't even begin to wonder what that's like. We have become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink, and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We are given, we have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Now I want to pause there and talk for just a moment because there is this concept that gets <coughs> misused in the body of Christ. And that's this concept of generational curses. Okay? In fact, um, I will take a quick look at the verse where that comes from. See if I can look it up for you. Where this typically comes from, still don't have the right one. Yeah, go to Numbers 4.18 real quickly. Numbers 4, chapter 18, or verse 18. And this is from one of the books of the law, the first five books of the Bible. 14.18, I apologize, wrong chapter. 14.18. It says, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And so there's a movement in the church today that says that Christian believers can be under generational curses. That if your father was an alcoholic, you'll be an alcoholic. Or if your mother was, was uh, someone who was given to, to be in debt and financial hardship, you'll be in financial hardship. And the, there's these things called deliverance ministries where, where they believe that they have to break the bondage of those curses off of you. And, and unfortunately, this is one of the ditches that the charismatic side of the church has a tendency to get into. I'm going to explain to you how generational curses work in reality really quickly. Okay. The Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us because the prophets say that cursed is a man who hung upon a tree. So because Jesus became a curse for us, that means if you are in Jesus Christ, you are not cursed. There is no curse from your father, from your grandfather, from your great-grandfather, from your great-great-great-grandfather hanging upon you that needs to be supernaturally broken if you understand 
who you are in Jesus Christ. We do not have to have some special deliverance service where we tell the demons of a generational curse to come off of you. We just have to recognize, no, you don't, you don't get it. I've been adopted. That curse ended when I got adopted into the house of my heavenly father. And all that comes from my heavenly father is blessings because my heavenly father ain't cursed. Does that make sense? So what is being talked about when in a place like Lamentations, we hear in chapter, chapter 5, verse 7, our fathers are sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Their, this generation that, that was coming back, their fathers had sinned and were put into captivity. Their sins had caused the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city walls, and ultimately the captivity itself. Bearing their iniquity doesn't mean that they were cursed to continue to be under that because the new generation had the choice to rebuild the walls. They had the choice to rebuild the temple. And one of the things that we begin to see when we read in Ezra and Nehemiah, and they are rebuilding, is that they begin to celebrate the feasts that were neglected since the time the law was given for the first time since. We read, we did that whole series on the feast this year. Great for your personal edification, go watch it. But the thing is, even though they had all those rules to keep those seven feasts every year, to remember who they were set apart as a nation unto God, they didn't keep them except for a few specific periods of revival in their history. And one of the first things they do when they come back is to keep one of the feasts. In fact, they even set up special rules for the keeping of that feast because there were people in different parts of the world. And so they said, this group that is here, when they see the new moon, they can celebrate the feast here. But we're even going to let those people who may not see it for a few days later keep it on a different day so that everybody can keep this feast. See, the new generation had the choice not to repeat the sins of the father. So what does it mean that they bore their iniquities? Sin has consequences. And consequences don't just get erased with a magic wand. It was going to take time for that new generation to come back into the land and sow obedience unto God for the blessing that God wanted them to have to take root, grow, and bear fruit for them. Yes. Have you ever started something new? Right? God told you to do something. You started to step out on faith. But as soon as you started to step out. You met some resistance. It got a little bit tough. It didn't just. You know. The Red Sea didn't just part for you. You had to slog it out for a little while. See, sometimes when people come to Christ, you know, our spirit's made new immediately. You with me? 100% wall-to-wall Holy Ghost, as much like God as you will ever be. But the circumstances and the consequences of your life of sin before that will still be there for a little while. And while the Holy Spirit has the power to deliver from addiction and the Holy Spirit has the power to immediately heal, if you do not change your thinking... You will, res you will restrict the types of manifestations you can see in your life. That is why Romans 12 said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind according to the word of God. Does that make sense? So that's what Jeremiah is talking about here. Let's go on with verse 8. <clears throat> Look at the irony in the verse that he's about to say here. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. What is he talking about? I just try to bring meaning to these verses for you guys. In Israel's history, they were a conquering nation, right? The way they came into the promised land, they took over other races. 
And so those, those races, and I don't mean this in a racial sense, but they took over the Hittites. They took over Canaanites. They took over the Philistines. They took over, and all throughout their history, those, those tribes would try to rise up and reassert themselves. But when a godly king, David or, or Solomon or different godly kings at different times or even the period of the judges ruled according to God's way, then those ungodly pagan tribes were subject to Israel, and they were servants to Israel. But because everything is upside down, returning from the captivity and living in a land that has been dispossessed because of their sin, now those that used to be their servants are ruling over Israel. Everything's been turned upside down. Nothing's the way that God intended for it to be. <clears throat> it says, our skin is hot. I'm sorry, verse 9 first. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven because of the fever of famine. They ravish the woman in Zion, the maidens in the cities of Judah. Princes were hung up by their hands. And elders were not respected. Young men ground at the millstone. Boys staggered under loads of wood. The picture that Jeremiah is painting, and the reason that this is a sign for grief, we saw victory in chapter 4. We talked about... <laughs> Jeremiah turning his heart back to God and saying, this is what happens when we repent because where God wants us to be. But in effect, in chapter 5, Jeremiah is just getting real. He, he's just saying, I, I know I made a lot of promises of what God would do if you turn your heart back to him. But don't let the reality of what you see with your eyes determine what God's capable of. See, that's why some of these books, and I know it's hard when it becomes a book like Jeremiah with, you know, dozens of chapters in it, to sit down and to read it at one setting. And even then, a book like Jeremiah, because the scrolls were destroyed and they had to be re-put together, Jeremiah and his assistant had to re-part, rewrite parts of it in, in their own lifetimes. So Jeremiah is not a book that happens sequentially. But with a little book like Lamentations, we get to kind of see that flavor and, and the context of the larger picture, right? That's why I tell you guys, when you're in your own Bible study sometimes, when it's books like Hebrews or it's books like the epistles, Corinthians and, and Colossians, take the time and have the discipline to at least once a year, I suggest, you know, more than that, don't just read a chapter as part of your daily devotions, but, but read that entire book in its context because it was written as a letter. The chapters and the verses didn't even come to like 1200 AD. Understand why they were written. The message that, that Jeremiah is making here is I promised you hope. You remember in, in our last session we talked about how Jeremiah gave his own personal testimony. I was in a pit. I was in a cistern. I was left to drown there. God brought me out of it. He was speaking to that generation. You're, you're at your low point. God's got a promise for you. God's not done yet. God promised to keep a remnant for himself. God's going to restore. Remember, God made his promise for restoration because he had promises unfulfilled to Abraham. He had promises unfulfilled to David. He told Abraham that the, gener the, the nation that he made from him would never pass away from the earth. He told David that there would be a king from his bloodline that ruled from the throne in Jerusalem forever. He had to keep his promises. But that generation, that the generation of fathers that sinned and was no more, they fell under judgment. I want to give you guys some good news right now. This is something I even had to share with some people on Facebook. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit in the next session. People think that we exist under God's judgment, that God, people think that if we elect the wrong person to presidential office in 2020, that the judgment of God is going to fall and it's going to be like 
Sodom and Gomorrah were child's play. My friends, God is not in the judgment business right now because judgment, you don't exist under judgment. The flood, eight people were a remnant that were pulled through that. Everybody else, judgment didn't go so good for them. Sodom and Gomorrah got judged. How many survived? Lot and his family. Everybody else? Hmm. They know what Ash Wednesday means. The generation that was afraid to go in and conquer Israel, and they listened to the ten tribes that said there were like grasshoppers in the sight of giants, what happened to them? They died in the wilderness. The two that said, we can do this, they lived long enough to be the generals that led the next generation in to conquer Jericho. Judgment is final. We don't exist under judgment. Judgment is always the last word on the people who are judged. The generation that went into the captivity died in captivity. But the remnant that God pulled back, Jeremiah is saying, I know everything looks upside down. But don't let that take your mind off the fact that God's the one who pulled me out of a system. I know right now you're serving those who used to serve us. Don't let that focus your thoughts on what your future has to be. Your present does not determine your future your king does Does that make sense because that's what happens when god starts to speak into our heart and he tells us we want to do something and man i tell you what in your prayer closet i don't care whether it's an actual closet or like me it's your shower you're in there the fans you can't hear the world nothing's going you're 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 having a hallelujah Happy time with Jesus. And then you get out and the real world hits and you go, well, that's not going to go like I thought it was. You don't let what the real world says tell you what your realer God is going to do. Keep going. Verse 14 says, the elders have ceased gathering at the gate and the young men from their music. Now, if you don't know what that means, this is just a good time to tell you that, that the town hall of any city in ancient Israel was the gate of the town, and that is where the oldest people, the, the leaders, the wizened men who had the most influence politically in the town would come. They would sit and they would hold council. That is ubiquitous throughout the entire Old Testament. That's just how it's done. You don't see things like that change really until the occupation of the Roman Empire in the New Testament. All the gaiety, all the fun, all the frivolity of men, the young boys dancing through the streets, playing their music that made the city a happy place to be. It was quiet. Verse 15, the joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this thing, because of this our heart is faint, because of these things our eyes grow dim. But, you know, eyes growing dim, that's... that's, that's Typically, you know, it was said of Moses that he lived 120 years and that his strength had not abated and his eyes had not grown dim. That's, that's a euphemism for bad eyesight, right? We, we mean that he didn't have to wear spectacles. You know, they didn't have them back then, but just the same. Moses wasn't squinting going around like Mr. Magoo. But I want for just a moment... Because that, that version of what that says is like for the person inside looking out, their vision got bad. I want you to look at it from the other way. I want you to look at somebody who's going through this life. Do you think they have light and joy in their eyes? Do you think that their eyes are glistening? I often say that some people smile with their lips and other people, they just smile with their eyes. 
like they, they light up when, when they smile and it's more here than it is here. And so I think there's two facets, and this is just my opinion, but I think there's just two facets to how you can interpret that verse because, yes, it can mean that inside they've lost their ability to see what God can do. But from people looking at them, it means they've lost the light of life that made them special. We don't want to fall into either one of those categories. Because we have the light of life on the inside of us. And as long as our vision is firmly set on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we do not let our eyes grow dim about what he is capable in of our lives, he can transform any circumstance that we are in. And as long as that is what is going on on the inside of us, when people on the outside are looking at us, they are going to see a light in our eyes that refuses to dim, and then they will say, what is different with you? How do I know that to be true? Because again, I don't venture my opinion very often, but if you look at Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, all three men who were dispossessed and brought into a, a camp of servitude within the royal household of the emperor of Babylon, those four men stuck out. They were different because they never took their eyes off of what God was doing. And so therefore, when the king himself looked at him, he said, what's up with those boys? They're 10 times better than all these other guys I've been trained. You with me? Verse 18 says, because of Mount Zion, which is desolate with foxes walking about on it. Foxes are seen as scavengers. In the Old Testament, they're, they're, you, you, could, you could rephrase that, vultures are circling. He says, now look, look at the pivot. That was a depressing chapter, was it not? And we are right at the end of this book. I mean, we are four verses out, and Jeremiah is going to drop his quill like a mic drop and walk off the scene of history Forever. He's got four verses left. If I were, as a writer, I would be like, oh no. I mean, when you're plotting out a story, there is no worse feeling to like, you're painting that story and you're coming to the end and you're like, oh, how am I going to get out of this? I've backed myself right into a corner. Watch the pivot in verse 19. Michelle's laughing every time I say that word because of friends. Pivot. You, O oh Lord, remain forever. I, we could close the book right there. You, O oh Lord, remain forever. Mic drop, walk off the stage. But he's not done. He says, your throne from generation to generation. And we read that and we think generation to generation. Oh, God is forever. That's not what Jeremiah is talking about. Remember how specific Jesus was in Matthew 18, 490? What he is saying in this one little verse, he's saying, you will, Lord, remain forever. In the generations that sinned for 490 years that put us into this captivity, you were still on the throne. Your prophets were warning your people. The generation that refused to repent while I was a prophet and they got taken into captivity, you were still on the throne. And when they died in captivity, you were still on the throne. And I got good news because those kids that they had in Babylon that grew up from year 10 to year 20 to year 30 to year 40 that have never seen Israel from Dan to Beersheba, from the Mediterranean to Jordan. They have never walked in what we knew as the promised land. I got good news. Nehemiah, you're not here yet. I'm standing in a destroyed Jerusalem. You're growing up. You're going to wind up being the cupbearer to the king. Daniel, 
you're in Babylon right now. You don't, you do not know me, but you're going to read my prophecy. You're going to see that I said it was going to last 70 years and you're going to put your face toward Jerusalem. You're going to repent. You're going to begin to pray. And the angel Gabriel himself is going to come to you and tell you how God's going to fix it all. Because that generation that's going to come back, that generation that's going to be released by King Cyrus, as Isaiah prophesied, would happen to come back and to rebuild the temple of God because God keeps his promises. That generation, God's on the throne for them too. That's an awesome pivot. That's an awesome place to be. Verse 20. He says, why do you forget us forever? And forsake us for so long a time. And a lot of people would read that verse and oh man, I just, I feel the Holy Spirit. A lot of people would look at that verse and they would just say, see, that's hopelessness, that's sadness. Jeremiah is not an idiot. He hasn't written this lamentation with a lack of hope. We've seen hope in chapter 3. We've seen hope in chapter 4. We're at the end of chapter 5. People are thinking, see, he's just desperate. He's not desperate. He's an attorney. That's a, that's a rhetorical question. What's the first rule when you're in a courtroom and you're an attorney questioning a witness? Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. Why do you forget us and forsake us for a long time? He is now going to give the answer in the last two verses of a book that has been full of mourning and sorrow. He says, turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. I think, well, that sounds like he had doubt. Are you kidding me? This was a man of whom it was said, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah more times than you can probably count. He knows God is not utterly angry with him because he knows God's got a promise to Abraham. And he knows God's got a promise to David. And he knows that God promised that it would only last 70 years. He knows that God said he's going to do something. He knows that there is no way God is that angry because he promised to bring back a remnant. And that's what he's telling that generation. You reign on the king. You reign as king from generation to generation. Why have you forsaken us? Why does it feel like it's forever? Because if you turn us back to you, you will renew our days. Let me tell you what, when failure begins to rise up in my life, when I start to feel like, oh man, another decade's coming on me, 40, July 25th, 2020, the 30s are gone, what happened, I don't know. Some of you think that's still young, I know, but you know, Dennis, I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to see 2100. So, the reality is, God can do for you what he did for Moses. He can, you can be 120 years old, your strength is not abated, your eyes have not dim. God can renew your strength like eagle's wings. God can say your beginning is at 60. God can say your beginning is at 70. God says it is never too late for me to turn it around. If you repent, if you come back to me, if you make me the center of your focus, if you never let your vision of me dim, then the light that is in your eyes will never go out. Lamentations, chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, is a song of hope. And that, my friends, is the book of Lamentations. Let's take a break.